We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Hello and welcome to Tractor Time. Tractor Time is brought to you by Barn to Door and Acres USA, the voice of eco agriculture. I'm your host, Ben Trollinger, editor of Acres USA Magazine. On this episode, we welcome Rick Clark. Rick is a fifth generation farmer based in Warren County, Indiana, but he's been spreading the no till organic gospel far and wide for the last few years. He gave a keynote address at the Acres USA Healthy Soil Summit back in the summer, and just this month he was a featured speaker at the Acres USA EcoAg Conference in Columbus, Ohio. And if you've ever heard Rick speak, you know how much of an evangelist he is for soil health and ecological farming. His enthusiasm is infectious. He's definitely not hiding his light under a bushel. In fact, big food brands have started taking notice of Clark's production methods. Rick was named Danone's Sustainable Farmer of the Year in 2017, and Lando Lakes recently recognized his work with an Outstanding Sustainability Award. So why is Clark getting this attention? Because he's proving that an obsessive focus on soil health and not just on yield can work at a commercial scale. I'm thrilled to share this interview with you today, but before that, a word from our sponsor. I want to take this moment to introduce our sponsor, Barn to Door. They're doing a new segment aimed at helping farmers, and you'll hear that later in this episode. But who are they? Barn to Door powers farmers who sell direct, helping them increase sales, access customers, and save time. They help farmers meet buyers' expectations through easy ordering and an accessible brand across online channels. Farmers use software, services, and resources from Barn to Door to manage and promote their business. The bottom line is this, farms that provide convenient buying and delivery options reach more buyers. Data show farmers can double revenue when they offer online subscriptions and direct delivery. Promote your brand, manage your orders, and keep your profits with Barn to Door, providing the capabilities and support you need to build a thriving farm direct business. Learn more at barntodoor.com forward slash tractor time. Okay, so Rick Clark. His family has farmed near Williamsport, Indiana since the 1880s. Today, the family is producing organic corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, and more on 7,000 acres. And Clark is quick to point out that they were historically among the worst offenders in terms of excessive tillage and toxic chemistry. But over the last 15 years or so, that's all changed. Today, Clark is proving that no-till organic production methods can lead to both a profitable business and a healthy, balanced ecosystem all at a commercial scale. Yes, that means no till, no pesticides, no herbicides, no synthetic fertilizers, but it isn't just about what he isn't doing. Clark is also perfecting the craft of cover cropping as well as the use of livestock within cropping systems. Clark says his strategy is to work with Mother Earth to create self-sustaining, closed-loop ecological systems that are teeming with biodiversity and fertility. But he's also obsessed with collecting data and using technology to his benefit. What he's not obsessed with is yield. To him, it's almost a five-letter word. The most important consideration for Clark is the long-term health of his land, and his vision might just be the future of agriculture. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Rick Clark. Welcome to the show, Rick. Hey, Ben, how are you today? I'm doing great. So you're a fifth-generation farmer, and I assume there's a lot of received wisdom and assumptions that go along with that. But you've really established a new path for your no-till organic farm in Indiana over the last several years. Um, And I'm curious to know, how has your approach to farming changed over time? And sort of what's the baseline? Where did you start out? What were your approaches? You know, when you think, when you go back and you think about when was the first time you tried a cover crop or when was the first time you tried to do no-till and you think about what it is the reason why you did that it tends to be a defensive mechanism. And what I mean by that is, is we're playing defense against something that's happened. And for us, it was erosion. So now we are viewing cover crops as a defensive mechanism to stop or or slow down erosion. Okay, now that as you evolve in through time and you become more comfortable with what these cover crops can do for you, and you become more comfortable with how far you can let them grow, they now become offensive juggernauts. 
and that's what they are now. They're they're an absolute offensive juggernaut because Ben, we are now heading into year eight of no synthetic inputs on this farm. And I'm probably getting ahead of, into your questions, but we're gonna I'm gonna go ahead and go there. The input costs are just out of control right now, skyrocketing. I don't know. I mean, I'm not in this game anymore, so all I hear is the fringes, but I'm hearing that you may not even get nitrogen, you know, guaranteed that you'll have it. So that is scary. So to go back to your original question, when we were some of the worst tillers and mass destructors of soil in the community, I mean, we were, we did it with the best of them. If it wasn't black when you did it, you did it again until it was. And, and that's just how we did it. Well, we were, we were in a situation where we were prepping a field like we always do. And uh, in the spring, we ran it shallow first, real shallow, because we were too early to be out there. It was too wet. So you're trying to open the soil up, let Mother Nature's beautiful sun and breeze dry things out. Then you work it a little bit deeper the second time. And then you go home and you come back tomorrow and you plant that field. Well, in that evening, we got a one inch rain event. And that one inch rain event, I could not believe how much soil had moved off the farm, you know, into the ditch and, and onto the road even. And that's, that's been, that's when it hit me like a Mack truck. And I'm, I'm like, we've got to do something different. And, and that's, that's really where the journey started from. So that's where the journey started. You were seeing this sort of large soil erosion event happen as a result of rainfall. And was the initial idea, we've got to do something to keep this, the soil and, you know, in place. And you thought, well, okay, maybe cover crops, or were you thinking sort of big picture, like we're going organic, we're getting rid of all these inputs. How, what, like how small was the sort of that little inkling that you had at that moment? That, that right there was just, Okay. How can we do this differently and not have this happen again? Yeah. That's where all my brain was. So luckily we had the, the beginnings of the internet. You could do research. You could do a, you could, you could sit down. I mean, it was slow, cumbersome, but you could do some research. I discovered that tillage radish is probably what we needed to start with. And when I sat down and, and I, I, I know that tillage radish is not going to be great for stopping erosion. But the reason why I picked a tillage radish is because it mitigates compaction. I don't care how good of a job you do. Everybody's got compaction. Everybody. So it mitigated compaction. It had a deep tap root that went down and, and gathered nutrients from far below our feet and brought them back to that tuber on the surface. And then probably the most important thing for me at that point in time was the fact that it winter killed. So that means this species that you're going to grow in the fall, when the temperature drops cold enough, it will kill and terminate that species. So I didn't have to worry about dealing with that species next spring because I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, so that's why tillage radish was picked. Now, I think also... It is extremely important that a farmer who tries things that are out of the norm, or like I like to say, change is good, try something different, you have to have success that first time you do this. And we had success. So that's why I got hooked so quick. That field that we only did one field, a 200 acre field. That one field that we no-tilled uh, no those radishes into the next fall was the best yielding field on the farm. Now, I'm talking just flat out yield. I don't mean return on ROI because we had no tillage expense. We had no uh, uh, passes of, of tillage in the spring because I thought, you know what, if we're going to do this, let's go ahead and no-till the corn into this field. Let's just try to do it all like I think I might want to do this one day. So not only did it blow the doors off of the whole farm on ROI, but it also was the best yielding field on the farm. That's all I needed. I had success and I was hooked. And now you start to think, okay, Ben, how 
quickly now can we move this across the farm? Yeah. So take a moment to describe your farm. It's in Indiana. Whereabouts and, you know, how, how many acres are you, are you farming there? Yeah. West Central Indiana, we were right on the Indiana-Illinois line, and we are right in line with the border between Missouri and Iowa. So all of Iowa is north of us, all of Missouri is south of us. We we are farming around 7,000 acres, and we have transitioned about 90% of the farm to organic. I mean, it's certified now. Mm-hmm. We have the last remaining acres will be certified next spring. And then the whole farm is all the way organic. Now, I think if you look at where we are today on this farm, Ben, I am way off to the side somewhere because we are doing things that I don't know if too many other people are doing. And this is hard. I mean, we're doing organic with zero tillage. You know, we're not even using any products that are OMRI approved. And OMRI is an acronym for an organization that approves products that you can use on certified organic acres. We don't even use any of those products. We're trying to be as holistic and symbiotic with Mother Nature as we possibly can. Now, this is hard. I cannot stress enough how hard this is. But here's what I want to say about this. Yes, I'm way over here and Over to the other side of the room are the folks that do nothing. Then there is all kinds of room on this curve that we can land and start to implement these six principles of soil health. We can start to, you know, slow down the use of chemistry, slow down the use of synthetic fertilizers. I, I wish that every bean was grown into cereal rye. I mean, we can do this. Anybody can do this. Cereal rye and soybeans. I just wish there was more happening at a little bit of a quicker pace. Now, it's gaining every year, but we really need this thing to be really moving forward. So you're growing certified organic corn and soybeans. Mm -hmm. We're up to about seven crops now. Corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, uh, milo, peas, and cattle. And then I throw in a a little twist on it, and I call it plus one, seven plus one. The plus one is what I call regen. So what we've done, we've taken an acre out of production, which I know seems crazy. We take an acre out of production, and we focus on a massive cocktail package. We focus on the first thing we focus on. And remember where I'm at now, this is, you know, If you don't know what the six principles of soil health are, Google them, look it up, and you've got to understand these. Now, the one that was most recently added is context. Now, this is important because, Ben, there's probably people all around the world going to listen to this. So someone who's in a much different climate is not going to be able to do the same things that we're doing here. So we have to understand that. So in the context of what I'm explaining is where I'm located in the world. So when you you can get these cover crops established and you then get success. It just becomes an appetite that you have to have more. You've got to do more. How can I now bring on the next 500 acres? Or how do I go from four species cocktail to 12? And and then when you look at everything that we're trying to do here, it's all about building soil health and building human health. You know, I, there's so many things that, you know, life is fast and you've got to stop and slow down a little bit. And I slowed down a little bit the other day and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, you know, I'm the first generation that has been, chemistry has been involved in my life from day one when I started helping dad. Okay. So let me clarify that. Yes, dad had chemistry, but dad didn't get chemistry till he was in his late 40s, early 50s. I've been exposed to the chemistry ever since I was 14 years old and wanted to get, couldn't wait to get home from school to help dad do whatever he was doing in the field. So now I'm thinking to myself, wow, that's a long time. I've been exposed to these, this chemistry. I do not want to let my children be exposed to that. And I don't want my grandchildren to be exposed to that. So we are, we are doing things here, Ben, that 
that are way different than most people think. We're, we, we don't talk about yield. Please don't ask me any questions about yield because I don't talk about yield. And fortunately, a farmer's success is based on yield. And that's, that's too, that's unfortunate. That's too bad because there's so many other things you can base that a person's success on. Were they socially accepted in the community? How's their family life? You know, are they building soil health? Are they being a good steward? Are they being conservation minded? All of these things don't have anything to do with yield. So when you start to get down this road that I'm on, it just becomes a quest of how can you just think of things to do that no one else has thought of, or maybe someone's thought of them, but I've never heard it spoken in public or read about it. Yeah. Well, talk, talk a little bit more about cover crops, because I, I think this is a fascinating subject and something we've talked about on this podcast before. But, you know, for those who maybe aren't as familiar as you are with using cover crops on the farm, what benefits do they bring to the mix? And also, you know, talk about different strategies and different approaches that you can use with cover crops to accomplish different objectives. I have always viewed a cover crop as a mechanism to make things better than what they were before we started. I don't know why mother nature, you know, mother nature has forced my hand many times and has guided me and humbled me on where to go. So here's what I mean by that. If we're going to go out and spend 25, 35, $40 on a cocktail, the last thing I want to do is burn it all to the ground with chemistry on the first warm day of spring. Now, has it done us some good? Yes but there's so much more potential that was left on the table. So we've got to think about how are we going to build an armor to protect the soil? The only way to build that armor to have it around is you've got to let that cereal rye grow to be five or six feet tall. Then when you terminate it and roll it down like we do, you are laying down eight to 10,000 pounds of biomass that now serve as an armor, they're feeding the microbes, they're limiting evaporation. I mean, that, that's huge. Let's talk about that one for just a minute. So we've done all this work to build organic matter, build aggregate stability, increase water infiltration rates. We've got this thing running on high gear and we now go out and we terminate the cover crop at a point to where there's no armor covering the soil in the middle of July and into August. So now we're in the dog days of summer and the heat is bearing down and that moisture that we've tried to save in that profile is going straight up to the atmosphere as evaporation. That's what I'm talking about here. We've got to have the ground covered as many days as we possibly can. And it's also mitigating erosion. I don't care where you live, you have erosion. If you think your, your topography is a 0% slope and you don't have erosion, you are wrong. You have wind erosion and you still have water erosion. So keeping that, that, that cover crop, covering the soil the maximum amount of time we can is what I'm talking about when you when I say let the cover crops do what they were intended to do. Now let's let me go another step on that. So now let's talk about a cocktail we were going to plant ahead of a corn crop that's going to be planted next spring. We are going to probably plant a cocktail that has a legume in it. And those legumes are going to fix nitrogen. So the last thing we want to do is go out and terminate that cover crop early in the spring because it hasn't maximized what we put it out there to do. That is to fix free nitrogen. We do testing here all the time, Ben. And two years ago, we topped out with some Balanza fixation clover and a little bit of volunteer hairy vetch. And we topped out at about 200 and 65 pounds of nitrogen that that crop had fixed. 
And so now, now that's not all available now. I understand that, but I'm going to take a large portion. I'm going to take half of that credit now. So now that's where I'm going to come in and I'm going to bring in the farmers that are listening today. And I'm going to bring them in that aren't doing any of these practices. And I'm going to say, look, follow me here, do this, plant these legumes, Get it to the point in the growing season next spring where let's say you can take 120 pounds of credit and you're going to take half of that as right now available for your current crop you're going to plant. So that's 60 pounds of in. So I'm asking you to spend $25 to then reduce your synthetic load of nitrogen by 60 pounds and use the credit from that cover crop to be that bridge between the nitrogen you think you're going to need. So now let's put this in the, into uh, economic terms. Let's just, I mean, nitrogen right now is almost a dollar a unit of N. So if you can save 60 pounds of N, that's $60 an acre that you're not going to spend on synthetic N, the cocktail I'm going to have you plant is going to cost 25. So you're $35 ahead an acre on just the N and then if you look back and look at all of the other nutrient and minerals that that cocktail is going to sequester, you're bringing in P2O5, K2O, sulfur, boron, manganese, magnesium. All these things are also coming along with that same $25 cocktail that you have already offset in your nitrogen savings. That's how I'm talking about you don't have to join me way over here on the on the wacky side of Indiana. Let's come in the part way and let's take advantage and start being less dependent on these synthetic fertilizers. So you mentioned um, a few moments ago, the six principles of soil health. And I was hoping you could kind of walk us through that because you, know, you mentioned they could Google it and I would encourage everyone to do that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm interested in hearing you talk more about the necessary components in your mind of what constitutes soil health. Right. I am a firm believer that you can go out and determine soil health with the spade that's in the back of your pickup bed. And I hope every farmer's got a spade in their bed. And I'm not kidding, Ben. That's all you need. You can go out and you can, you can measure aggregate stability with a spade. You can go out and you can measure water infiltration rates. Now, you need more than a spade for that. I guess you need a hammer. You need a dead blow hammer to pound a ring into the ground and then pour some water in. But my point here is you don't need a lot of fancy fancy equipment that honestly hasn't been perfected and isn't accurate and repeatable every single time you use it. So, you know, I look at the six principles as you need to, you need to minimize or reduce uh, tillage. And in my opinion, you have to stop tillage. I think that when you are truly trying to build soil health, the number one thing that you have to get jump started and working are the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. They are the communication backbone of the microbial biome network. There's not a transaction of nutrients that takes place underground unless it goes through that arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi network. Okay, there's two good ways to wipe that network out, chemistry and tillage. So let's just talk about tillage for right now. So you bring your tillage through and you wipe all those communities out. And all they can do now is spend their time building that community back up and starting to get their fingers back out and make those connections just in time to have another pass of tillage come through and wipe it out. So if all that that network is doing is repairing itself, it's not doing anything toward building soil health. So number one on my list is tillage has to stop. Okay. Number two is going to be keep ground covered as much as you possibly can. Number three is keep a living root. Number four is diversity. Now, we haven't talked about that yet. Diversity is critical here because when you now understand how we are farming and we have taken everything away, so now I have to truly respect and honor what pests can do to me now. 
because I no longer have an easy button that I can push and go out and, and you know, spray a chemical that will target. Let's just pick on the army worm for a moment. There are products out there that will kill army worms, but they will also kill thousands of other beneficial species. I can't have that. I have spent the last 17 or 18 years of my life building soil health. I cannot jeopardize that. I will sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. I do it every single day. And that's why it's so hard for people to understand what it is I'm trying to do. If you're looking on the outside and looking in on our operation, that guy's nuts. What what is he thinking? But you don't understand that I'm trying to build this, this, this symbiotic relationship with Mother Nature. And eventually, when I'm ready to hand the reins off of this thing, this thing is going to be in in some kind of a cruise control because we are going we we're listening to what mother nature's telling us we're trying to do what she wants us to do and that is so hard so you know if and that, that i've given you four of the six i'm going to give you the other two right now and then i want to say something else the other two are are well the one of them is for sure the context one that one's for sure that's important the last one is the 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 integration of livestock. Now, this is not for everybody, but if you truly want to build soil health the most efficient way and the quickest way, it is got to have livestock incorporated onto the operation and do rotational grazing. Now, I am not a, a grazing expert. There are many of people out there that can teach you how to graze. I graze in ways that probably aren't totally approved by most people, but I've got so much going on. I can't have, I don't have time to move cattle every two hours. So what I do is I build paddocks that last about six or seven days, but I still follow the principles of the grazing, you know, 50, no more than 50% of the growth eaten down. And so much can is to be left alone and not not taken off. And once you reach those, if you thought you were going to be in this paddock for seven days, then it winds up being four because of what the rules tell you. So be it. You got to move to the next. You got to move to the next paddock. But I'm trying to do this in a way that fits better into the time that I have available. Now, I never thought about this until right now, but I would like to add a seventh one. And that seventh one has to be commitment. If you are going to go down this road, and I don't care, it's like I mentioned earlier, you got zero doing nothing all the way to where I am of organic no-till, anywhere in between there. If you want to land on that curve somewhere, you've got to be committed and stay with it and let it come to you. Because Ben, you're not going to go out in year one and probably see the kind of change that you think you need to see in year one. Now there's going to be change, but it may not be at the speed you think it should happen. So that's what I mean by being committed. This takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. But it seems to sort of afford you and grant you a certain level of independence. I think earlier you were mentioning just how high input costs have, have gotten recently. And you're sort of out of that game. And, you know, especially since you're incorporating animals into your operation, you're also sort of have your own homegrown source of fertility. You know, is that sort of the goal is to be maybe not standalone, but to be as independent and autonomous as possible? Yes. I'll tell you how I like to phrase this. I like to call it closing the loop. That's what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to do vertical integration. We're trying to do all of these extra things that we can add to this farm. We've got our own meat that we're raising now. It's naturally raised. It's being done in our regenerative system. It's being, they're, they're grazed across the farm. All of these things are being done. The animals are treated in a humane manner. All of these things are being done, and we're trying to market that meat as retail natural beef. That's one way. Another way is we're going to start milling our own grain. We're going to then take the milling from that grain, that regenerative grain, we're going to put it in packages and sell it as five, 10 pound packages. These are the things that 
that yes, make you more independent, not quite so dependent on the system. Uh, I do not want to be dependent on this system. I do not. I mean, I have gone so far now, Ben, that I no longer take uh, multiple crop insurance. I've now, I'm going to be heading into year four of no crop insurance. I'm going to be heading into, into uh, year three of no longer being involved in any government programs, period. ARC, PLC, nothing. I took no CFAP uh, subsidy payments in 2020. I mean, this is how dedicated and like I said earlier, commitment. I think if you're going to add a number seven to these uh, principles of soil health commitment, that's how committed I am to doing this. And at the time, at the current time, I have a voice that, that people want to listen to. And I appreciate that. And I'm trying to be as open and transparent as I possibly can. I mean, if you want to spend the rest of this time about the pitfalls of what what not to do, I'd be more than happy to talk about that. I'll talk about anything you want to talk about, almost anything. <laughs> but my point is, I am in this thing for the long haul. There is no other way for me to farm. We're going to hit pause on this interview for a brief segment from our sponsor, Barn to Door. Hey, this is Sebastian with Barn to Door. We help farms sell direct. Is your farm ready for 2022? Over at our Direct Farm podcast, we have a series titled Direct Farm Tactics to equip farmers with actionable tips to sell direct. Our most recent episode is all about securing pre-orders for 2022. And here's a sneak peek. A lot of farms aren't necessarily quite as active during the winter, but it definitely doesn't mean that you need to go completely off the grid, even though the season is over. So Eliza, can you start by just telling us why should farmers be thinking about taking pre-orders? Yeah, definitely. So farmers should take pre-orders for next year just because cash flow during the off season is just going to be really helpful for the business for next year. This gives farmers the opportunity to finance for maybe that new delivery truck that they've been eyeing or even that extra freezer space as you continue to grow. Customers are looking to buy during the holiday season, capitalize on that. It's just a really great experience for you and your customers with the farm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. Like, even though the products might not be available right away, people are still definitely looking and more and more every year to shop online, make those easy purchases as gifts or just in the spirit of the holidays. Uh, And what better gift than a subscription to your great local farm products? Yeah. And one thing to also think about is connecting with your local buyers and build that relationship with your customers, your community. Your buyers are really looking to buy something special, especially during the holiday season. And even though your customers might be out next summer or really not sure about next year, buyers can skip a week or even donate a box to a local food drive. If you'd like to hear more, head on over to the Direct Farm podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts or go to barntodoor.com slash resources to find many more free resources for your farm business. Thanks for listening. You, you have become a bit of a, an evangelist for this kind of regenerative farming that you're describing. You know, I've seen you talk a few times and you have, you know, as, as our listeners can tell, you're very enthusiastic about the subject and you want to spread the word. What is it that you want other farmers to know about? Because to me, it's not just the techniques. It seems like there's a philosophy that underlies what you're doing. And there's also, maybe I would describe it as a joy in what you're doing and you want other people to know about it. There's not a lot of things that bother me. Uh, I mean, I don't sit up at night worrying. I, I sleep very well, but you know, one of the things that probably weighs on me more than anything is how good of an, of an ambassador am I to my local community? That, that bothers me because honestly, when you look at our farm, I, Ben, I have no one else to call. I don't have anybody to call. Hey, have you tried this in an organic no-till? Well, no, Rick, we don't do that. Well, okay. I have to do all these things. And well, then my neighbors drive by and they look at that like, my God, what is wrong with that guy? Why is he doing what he's doing now? I don't even know what he's doing out there. So that, that bothers me because unfortunately in the world we live in today, too many decisions and opinions are based on perception. And I just wish they would stop their truck at the end of the road and climb in with me and say, Rick, 
you've lost your mind. You've got to explain to me what's going on here. Because what I'm afraid of is that what they're seeing sometimes are fields that didn't do what I thought they would do. And they look at those fields and say, I'm not doing what that guy's doing. That's the kind of stuff that bothers me. And I said something there that, that sparked a thought. I no longer use the word failure. You have to take negative thoughts and negative words and negative people out of your life. There is so much going on with this system that we're, that we're constantly trying to make better every day. I mean, Ben, it's, it's December the 1st today, and I've been through every letter of the alphabet in plants. So that reaches the point where you say, what is wrong with me? How come I can't get this figured out? So you have to take the negativity out. It's no longer that field failed. It's that field has an outcome that I did not expect. And how are we going to learn from this? And how are we not going to do it again? That's how I view this. So I guess that's the one thing that probably bothers me the most is Today, I'm not the best ambassador I probably should be to my local community, but please have a little faith with me here. We are getting better at this every single year. Now, we're a long way from perfection, a long way, but this is the type of stuff that we have to do so the people that are coming behind and trying something different, they'll have success and they'll take it to the next level. Then the next thing you know, we've got... 20% of the acres being farmed in some fashion of what we're talking about today. You described a closed loop system, that being sort of the goal or one of the goals. And you're also sort of describing a process of experimentation and observation as opposed to a process of failure. You, You really seem to make this sort of the cornerstone of your operation this observation, this sort of scientific experimentation, data gathering, and you're looking at mother nature as a teacher. You're looking at the wisdom of ecological systems to sort of instruct you on how to set up your agricultural system. Describe how that works for you. You know, what are you looking for? You know, people talk about, you know, weeds tell you a lot about what's going on in your field. The pests that are showing up in your field tell you a lot about the health of your soil, et cetera. So like, what are, what are you observing every day as you're walking your fields and, and how does this process play out for you? I mean, it seems like you're, you're a pretty um, deliberate and intentional guy. So you're, you must have a system for how you, you gather all these observations, all these experiments, and then you take that data and you make it work for you long-term. Yeah, you're, you're striking on a very important aspect of this success, data. You cannot collect enough data. So my advice to anyone who wants to get started, the first thing you do right now is get a piece of paper and a pencil out and start and just pick one field. Just pick one of your fields and think back and try to list all of the things that you did in that field. Just try it for 2021, just for this year. And then try to go back and do as many years back as you can. And then eventually get your whole farm into this. Then you've now drawn a baseline because like, you know, I always say, how do you know where you're going unless you know where you've been? So baseline where you are and then see if these things that I'm talking about today are going to work on your operation or not. You know, one year, two years, three years down the road. Yeah. You know what? That guy from Indiana was right. You know, I may have lost five bushel of yield corn, but my ROI went up by 25%. That's all I care about. I mean, that's how businesses are ran by. Businesses are not ran by uh, the amount of uh, product they sell. It's ran by the amount of profit they're making from the product they sell. Farmers no different. So, you know, I, I've got a couple of things that I really like to have in my, in my, let's call it my shirt pocket, for example. But there's a young man in Iowa that has a, a platform that I really think, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going to mention his name. It's Mitchell Hora. He's got a company called Continuum Ag, and he's got a product called Top uh, Topsoil. This is a way to track everything I've just talked about. It's a way to, to load everything onto his platform. It's encrypted. He's not going to sell your data any, to anybody. You own it. It's there. It's yours. 
You can pressure test it. You can do what if scenarios. That is where I would recommend someone who's done nothing is would be to get started on, on Mitchell's platform. Now, the other thing I like, and I was just talking about it to the guys this morning, is Evernote. Evernote is an app that is like a daily journal. So now when, when I've got all of the combine data and I've got all of the planner data and I'm sitting here looking at it and I don't see anything different from the Smith field to the Brown field, okay? Or whatever you name your fields, field one, field two. I don't see anything different here on what data I have in front of me. But now hang on, let's go to Evernote and let's take a look at a couple things. So now you go to Evernote and you say, oh, I see the difference here. Uh, field one was planted two and a half weeks before field two was. And if you look at the amount of rainfall that then occurred between the day one was planted and the day two was planted, two is short of rain by three inches. I mean, just stuff like that. So if you were going to come next spring and plant corn for us, Ben, you'd have to sit down and I'd have to train you because you've got to answer about 10 questions mm -hmm. before you even start planting corn. And one of the first things you're going to do is get out of your tractor and you're going to have a thermometer and you're going to stick it in the ground and you're going to get the ground temp. Then you're going to take a picture with your phone of what you're looking at, of what you're getting ready to plant into. And all of these things can get uploaded to Evernote. And the other thing I like about Evernote is when you upload a picture to it, you can add text to that picture. So now you, okay, you're, it's 75 degrees, it's a calm day, and the ground temp is, is 63 degrees. Now you're ready and you're going to take a picture of your seed tag and you're going to do all of this stuff. And by the way, we have to do all this for organic certification. You've got to keep track of everything that you do. But this is a great exercise for anybody to do. So now you've got everything documented and it's now tucked away in Evernote. And by the way, you can do this on Mitchell's platform and as the same thing I just described that you do in Evernote. You can do all this on his platform. Now, Ben, you've got this data. And what I, what I like to say is good data leads to good decisions that then put you in positions of strength. And this is important. When these markets rally like they did last spring and summer, if you have the data behind you to show that your system is resilient enough to average X amount of yield, whatever that yield is, I don't care what the number is. Now you can comfortably take a percentage of that yield goal expectation and sell into that rallying market because you've got the data behind you that makes you a little more comfortable to do those things. There's just so many things we could talk about. That data is critical to the success of this system. And, and I want to add, hang on just a second. I want to add one more thing. And we're not going to go deep into this unless you want to. But if you're going to participate in the up and coming carbon markets that everyone's talking about, you're going to need to collect data and you're going to need to abide by the six principles of soil. Well, at least five of them you're going to have to abide by. Now, if you want to go deeper on that, we can, but I just wanted to throw that out. Data is so critical across this whole spectrum. And like with everything you do, it's not just collecting data. It's that you have sort of, that is your, that is your data. You own that data. That is, yeah. that is not someone else's data that you're getting access to. So, yeah. but I have a question. You mentioned the importance of establishing a baseline with data so you can know where you started and where you're heading and how far you've gone for you and your farm. What was the baseline? Once you established that process of collecting data, what was the baseline back then? And what are some of the metrics of success that you've seen over the last few years? Yeah, well, I'm very fortunate. I've had great, great people ahead of me uh, that understood the values of buying land and collecting data and storing it. Ben, we've got data that goes back almost 30 years, 25 years. And we can look at fields and what we did to them and what, what we didn't do to them. And we've always been the type of people that at the end of the day, you just push the button and you say, give it all to me. 
Give me every chart. Give me every scenario you could think of. I want to see what our, our yields have looked like across soil type. I want to see what our yields look like across variety and hybrid. I want to see it across topography, all of these things. So when I really started, though, to pay attention to this is when I incorporated the Haney test. The Haney soil health test is a definite must for everyone. Now, we no longer use the old traditional soil test, no longer use it. We use the Haney soil test. And the reason why I'm saying you asked me this question of when did this click? It's because of the information that you get back from that test. I mean, you get you get Solvita, you get CO2 burst, you get PLFA, you get gram positive, the gram negative, you get predator to prey, you get uh, fungi to bacteria. I mean, it's endless. The amount of things that that test can give you. So we track all of those things. And, and Ben, I no longer look at single snapshots in time. You have to look at trends because I'm telling you, we could go out tomorrow and soil test and wait three weeks and go soil test the exact same spots and not get the same results back. So you have to understand that. And you can't just say that when you get that one year that spikes, that you have to react to that. No, you've got to now pull that back into the average of what's happened across your farm for the last umpteen years or whatever, however far back you can go. That's why it's so important. I mean, that kind of data is what led to, what is it, uh, VRT, when people go out and, and instead of, I mean, my dad always put on 500 pounds of 923.30 on every acre. Think about how expensive that is today. So now with the soil testing and the advancements that we've had in how you look at those tests, why do we broadcast fertilizer? Let's VRT or variable rate it. So you can't do that unless you collect the data. So all of this is so important to the success of any system you're in. You've got to have that data. And I, you know, I can't, Ben, I gotta, you gotta go back 20 years before I'd even start to get gray on when I started doing this. It was more than 20 years ago. Well, aside from data collection, what other tools are you using on the farm? You mentioned using roller crimper, I believe earlier, you know, so what yeah. are the mechanics of implementing this no-till organic system that you do ac across a wide swath of acres? Yeah. Number one is patience. Number one, patience. Yes. Everything that we are trying to do now the cover crop has to be either A, winter kill or, you know, cold temperature kills it, or B, mechanically terminate. That's all we got. So this becomes even more complex because I preach very loud on diversity. You have to have diversity. You've got to. And I look at diversity in three or in a, in a couple different ways. Actually, it's three different ways. I look at diversity within a cover crop cocktail of annuals to perennials. Too many times, all we do are plant annuals. That's all we do. So if you are in a chemistry world, please plant perennials with your annuals because your chemistry can take care of it. I can't do that anymore, Ben, because I cannot mechanically control or uh, mitigate a perennial control. I can't use that word. I can't control anything, but uh, to suppress it, I cannot suppress it mechanically. So I have to be very careful. Now, the, the next way I look at diversity is looking at it from a, a cash crop perspective. I think to gain maximum diversity, we need to start raising the same or, or different species in the same field and harvest them at the same time. For example, uh, peas and wheat, plant them together, let them work off their symbiotic relationships, let them help each other, let them build that microbial community, harvest them together, separate them at the end of the day, and you've got two products to sell. I think it's that kind of diversity that we have to have. Again, I can do that diversity 
it's that diversity of getting perennials in with your annuals is difficult for me, but please, if you're using chemistry, do all throw the kitchen sink at it and let these cover crops grow further into maturity next spring before you go out and terminate them. At least pick, at least pick a field, one field and try it Rick's way and just see what happens. I, you can't, we cannot jeopardize the livelihood of the farm here. And this is so critical now, Ben, because I mean, these inputs are so expensive and, and equipment's expensive and everything is going up in price. We cannot afford to stumble once now. So please do not jeopardize the livelihood of your farm by trying these practices. Go start small, get comfortable, and then, and then move into to bigger acres. Well, earlier you mentioned that you don't think of things in terms of failures, but I'm curious if there are, maybe we'll call them learning experiences that you've had since you've, you've started this process, this road that you've gone down into regenerative agriculture. What are the sort of those moments that stand out to you as where you gained insight through maybe challenges or difficulties or something like that? You know, what, what are the inflection points for you? Yeah, number one. I didn't realize how critical it was of the timing of when you plant a cover crop in the fall until you take chemistry away. Okay, let's look at cereal rye planted on September the 1st versus cereal rye planted on November the 15th. If you are in a chemically based system still and you're going to terminate that cereal rye chemically, you don't care. It does. It makes no difference to you because the parts of the field that got planted on September, or the, I'm sorry, the parts of the farm that got planted on September the 1st are going to have a tremendous growth of cereal rye. It's going to tiller. The biomass will be more than the, than the cereal rye plant on November 15th. I guarantee it. But if you've got that easy button of chemistry to push, what's it matter if there's a hole out there because you're going to kill everything that's in that hole anyway? Then you plant your cash crop and away you go. I cannot have those holes anymore because I have nothing to take care of that hole with because that hole, and what I mean by a hole is if you had a hiccup with your drill or you were planted on November the 14th and some of the field was wet and some of it was dry and that cereal rye got waterlogged and it died and then the other didn't. And now you've got half your field that next spring is, a, is an out of control weed mess and, and part of it is in an okay shape. That's what I'm talking about. So that's number one. I didn't realize the importance of the timing of planting the cover crop in the fall. Now, I want to go back a little bit with what I said earlier. I gave you the seven crops that we have in rotation right now, and I gave you a plus one. So anyone listening in the northern part of the, of the region here where it gets cold, I get it. You have difficulty getting these cover crops established. But in those seven crops plus one, I've given you three ways to overcome it. A cereal grain. Do not double crop soybeans behind that. It's now taken off in the middle of July, and you've now got July to focus on a cocktail of cover crops to, to blast on that acre. That's number one. Number two was livestock. You can either plant your, your cocktail into the into the cattle where they're standing, they're not going to hurt a thing. Or you come behind them as they've grazed across that field. That's number two way to get this in. And the third way was the regen year, because you're not going to have a cash crop on that field. So I've taken away the excuse that, oh, Rick, I live too far north. It's too cold. The growing season is too short. We can't do that here. Well, I've heard them all. I've heard all the excuses. We have to, and that goes back to what I said earlier. If I was going to add a seventh principle, it would be dedication. You've got to be dedicated on how to continually look at creative ways to do this. And I, I hope I mentioned your question, these inflection points. I think I am, but the patience that it requires, and you have to always be looking for validations. You need validation. Okay, for example, We've not applied any fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers on our farm for, for eight years. We've not applied any ag lime on our farm in eight years. Our soil pH is 6.8 and rising. 
that is a validation that what we're doing is correct because we've taken away the salts and the acids that affect your pH that then require you to add lime to get the pH back in alignment. Those are the types of things I'm talking about, Ben. That, that, that is what's telling you that, you know what, Rick, stay the course. This is, this is the right thing to do. Well, it seems like you have a lot of farming ahead of you in your, in your life. And I'm curious to know what your long-term plan is. You know, what, what does, what do the next 10 years look like for, for you, Rick? I'm, I'm 57 years old. I, I've definitely got 13 more tries at this. That takes me to seven, but I think I got, I think I've got 18 more that, that takes me to 75. So in this next 18 years, we're obviously going to continue to make the system that we're in now better. But now I think I think that what needs to happen now is we need to figure out what stimulants do we need to find in nature that will turn on certain microbes that still have not been turned on. Because I'm telling you, Ben, when, when you come through hundreds of years of tillage and, and well, not hundreds of years of chemistry, but there's only been about 40 years of chemistry. But all of this tillage that's led up to now and, and the 40 years of chemistry, we have absolutely turned off the microbes because they don't have a job. So they, they're, just, they're, just, they're just sitting back and they're doing nothing. So that partly plays into that. You always hear people say, it takes three or four years to see a field to start to react. It's because I think those mo- microbes that have a job are lazy and they're turned off because they, they no longer have a job to do. But once you start applying the principles of soil health, those microbes all of a sudden have got their job back. But it takes time to get everything kickstarted. So my next quest is going to be to look for how do we introduce stimulants to the system that help promote that microbial activity? Now, I didn't say add microbes to the system because we've got to be careful here. There's a lot of things being sold out there, and I I call them bugs in a jug, that if you look at the label, there's not anything in that jug that's alive. It's all dead. So we, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those stimulators that we can put in. I mean, do you realize that there are microbes in the soil profile that fix nitrogen? So if we could turn them on and have them working at peak performance, we wouldn't need any more nitrogen. So those are the kind of things I'm talking about. I mean, there are people out there that are working on breeding corn that fixes its own nitrogen. Who, who would have heard of such a thing? So there's all kinds of, of smarter people out there than I am that we just have to stop and listen and pay attention. But Mother Nature is, is t- trying to tell us that, that something needs to change. You know, I saw uh, in our area, Ben, we've got a disease that's, I think it's called... Uh, tar spot is that what it's called i think it's tar Hmm. spot and it affects corn it affects corn and i saw a lot of tar spot in neighbors fields and these corn fields were sprayed multiple times with fungicide and they still had tar spot and then i go out and i scout our fields and i don't find any none again that's a validation that we have health and that that is why we can kind of overcome some of these pest issues. Now, I, I don't want to say we're, we're immune to them. I'm just trying to say, I think we're building a system that is not going to have those pests be prevalent and, and, and cause mass destruction to, to our farm. That's all I'm saying. Well, Rick, I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, it's been, it's been a blast. I, I'll do it again. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, again, thank you so much, Ben. I, it's been an honor to be on on the Tractor Time podcast, and and thank you so much. There you have it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Tractor Time brought to you by Acres USA and Barn to Door. 
Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere podcasts are available. Also find us on AcresUSA.com, EcoFarmingDaily.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our monthly magazine. Acres USA is the premier North American publisher on production scale organic and sustainable farming. For over five decades, we have helped farmers, ranchers, and market gardeners grow food organically, sustainably, and without harmful toxic chemistry. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.